Welcome everybody. We're excited to have you here today. Um, Melissa and Brooke from Healthy Lifestyles, they are two of our health educators, are going to present on social well-being. Um, I have put in the chat box a sign-in link for you to get your 10 points today, but I will turn the time over to Melissa and Brooke and we can get started. Awesome. Well, we would like to welcome everybody to our social well-being presentation. My name is Brooke and I'm here presenting with Melissa. We're going to be talking a little bit about social well-being, what it means, what it means, and hopefully provide you with some tools and resources to bolster, bolster your overall social well-being. I feel like this is an especially important topic right now as we're all dealing with a pandemic that is difficult to socially interact with one another. And as a reminder, remember to fill out our survey in order to get points for healthy lifestyles points. Sadie has put the link to the survey in the chat box. So if you haven't already, get that pulled up and fill that out because we want you guys to get credit for tuning in today. But without further ado, we'll have Melissa get us started. Awesome, thanks Brooke. All right, and so we wanna start off by asking what does it mean to be socially well? So we all probably have a slightly different definition, so let me know what being socially well means to you in the chat box. And while you're doing that, I'll tell you the book definition of social well-being, and it refers to the relationships we have and how we interact with others. Social wellness involves building healthy, nurturing and supportive relationships, as well as fostering a genuine connection with those around you. To be well, people need to be loved and to love. And we have the need to belong and to be connected. And so does anyone have their own definition that they'd like to share of what it means to be socially well? And if not, that's fine too. All right. Well, Brooke, do you want to? Um, oh, someone did respond. Healthy relationships and boundaries. Oh, boundaries. That's a good one to point out. Good interactions with others. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, Brooke, do you want to jump into the next slide? Yes, so now we're going to watch this quick video that helps to give us a more in-depth understanding of social wellness. Okay. If you talk to someone that has been moved, a job, or retired, and ask them what they miss most about their past situation, one of the most common answers is that they miss the people that were in their life. What that actually means is that they miss the social connections or relationships that they had with them. Social connections or social interactions with other individuals is crucial for mental health, which in turn is crucial for overall health. Lack of social connections has shown to increase stress hormones in the immune system and lessen cardiovascular function. People who are lonely tend to consume more alcohol, exercise less, and less quality sleep. Social relationships allow you to share your achievements and support your time for talk. Imagine achieving a long term goal. What's the first thing you want to do? Tell someone, of course. Or imagine if something terrible happened. Having someone to lean on and talk to can make that event linger, make you feel even more isolated. Giving support in relationships can actually be more beneficial than receiving support. When someone shares something positive in their life with you, it's a compliment. They wanted you to be a part of their success, and they know that you have a sincere interest in their life. And when someone shares a tragedy in their life, you know they really trust you. They're looking to you to help them through this difficult time. Now, some social relationships can be negative. A person is constantly negative, has a poor outlook, bring you down and cause stress, making that relationship toxic. Someone that always talks about themselves and makes all of your interactions about them, well, that's not really a social connection. In that case, you're just an audience member and they're one person show how wonderful their life is. Poor marital or poor relationship quality 
and also weaken the immune system and erode physical health. Dealing with stress from a poor relationship, being over consuming food or alcohol, smoking, or taking medications to deal with the stress, which in turn can damage systems in the body. Connections through social media can be beneficial by allowing you to stay in touch with friends and family. However, social media connections are not a good alternative for face to face in person contact. Too much time spent on social media can lead to more isolation and a greater feeling of loneliness. It's a good practice to use social media in moderation. To be healthy, we need people in our lives. It doesn't need to be 5,000 Facebook friends, and we don't have to have everyone like us. Having strong social relationships with just a few people is fine. A few people that we can share life's good and bad moments with, a few people that we can connect with on a regular basis with no stress and no judgments. A few people who accept us for who we are. Surround yourself with good people, folks. Good people. Right. I love that video and I feel like it helps to give an overarching sort of idea of what social well-being is and the relationships that it entails. Um, at the end, it mentioned to surround yourself with good people. So how many of you believe that you have good people that you can rely on in your life? I know I feel lucky enough to have a support system in my life of family members and close friends and even coworkers who I know I can rely on and will always be there for me. But this will bring us into our first activity with Melissa. Thanks, Brooke. And so for this activity, we'll ask you to list three relationships that you value. And then for each relationship, list three reasons why you value them. And so we'll give you about two minutes to complete this activity. And I'll share one example to get you started. So I value the relationship with my mom. And the reasons why I value this relationship is that my mom is my biggest cheerleader in my life. She's always encouraging me to follow my dreams. She's fun and easy to talk to. And she's a great example to me of a strong woman. So we'll let you work on your list and please feel free to post your examples in the chat box as you come up with them. We have just about another minute or so, but I see some examples already coming in, so that's awesome. And Brooke shared with us that her husband is always supportive, he makes her laugh, and he makes life bearable in hard times. value relationship with my husband, my family, friends, because they are supportive. Great listeners, that is definitely something that I value as well. Yeah, and a lot of people just touching on the fact that the, the relationships that they value is um, that the people support them. So I like to see that trend there. All right. 
Well, thank you everyone who did share. Um, and you don't have to comment on this part, but I do want you to think about these things as we go through the presentation. So were there any similarities that overlapped in the relationships or values? And if there were differences, did they surprise you? Did this exercise help you identify what you look for in a relationship? Was it difficult to list why you value your relationship with anyone that you chose? Again, just keep this activity in mind as Brooke tells us what constitutes a healthy relationship. All right, thanks, Melissa. It was so fun reading all of your comments and you guys have hit it all on the head with um, different things that constitute a healthy relationship from support to encouragement. Um, they give good advice. They're fun and enjoyable to be with. That uh, contribute towards a healthy relationship. And so uh, what we have here is we're going to compare the healthy relationships versus unhealthy relationships. So a healthy relationship is when two people develop a connection based on mutual respect, trust, and honesty, just to name a few. But a healthy relationship should bring more happiness rather than stress into your life. So the first characteristic we're gonna talk about is in a healthy relationship, you can take care of yourself and have good self-esteem independent of your relationship. So you don't rely on the other person to validate you and to make you feel good about yourself and rather there is um you can find that from and within your own self next we have you're still able to maintain relationships with friends and family it doesn't the relationship you're in it doesn't take you away from them it doesn't isolate you from others and rather encourages you to bring them all together which is very important Next, we have you're able to express yourselves to one another, one another without fear of consequences. So you're able to have open communication. There's no fear of, oh, I can't speak my mind or else they're going to get upset. If you can really express yourself, you're able to communicate and grow. And lastly, we have you're able to trust each other to be honest with one another. You're not going to just say what you think the other person wants to hear you're again able to open and honestly communicate with one another. Moving on to unhealthy relationships, it's basically the opposite of what we've talked about. It's one that lacks mutual respect and support. It can cause pressure and stress that's hard to avoid. And this tension is unhealthy for both members of the relationship and may lead to problems in other areas of your life. So. We'd love to hear you all provided such great um, characteristics of a healthy relationship, but if you have any ideas or things that constitute an unhealthy relationship, please feel free to include it in the chat box and we'd love to uh, make note of that. But the first one we have is you put one person before the other by neglecting yourself or your partner. So there's not an equal sort of give and take. It's kind of your relationship revolves around one person, one person's schedule, one person's feelings, and there's no equality. Next, you feel the pressure to change who you are for the other person. You don't feel completely comfortable in your own skin, and you feel like you have to act or do a certain things in order to make that person happy. Next, we have you feel pressure to quit activities you usually used to enjoy, so they don't support your hobbies and they'd rather have you doing other things or uh, than what you used to do. Next, we have you do not you don't make time to spend with one another. So if you would rather spend time with family and friends than with the person you're in a relationship with, you're not taking that time to grow with one another. Um, and are able to really foster a healthy relationship. And lastly, we have experience of lack of fairness and equality, which we kind of touched on before. There needs to be, you need to be able to see each other eye to eye and know that there's going to be some give and take and ultimately 50-50. Uh, and know that you guys are both in it for the, um, the right reasons. 
So now that we've talked about healthy and unhealthy relationships and how they impact our social well-being, Melissa is going to talk to us about how um, the impacts our social well-being can have on our health. Yes, so we looked at a few studies and research has shown that the health risks of having poor social wellness are comparable to the dangers of smoking and obesity. Additionally, we found that people who are in unhealthy relationships are in a constant fight or flight mode. So this causes their bodies to produce adrenaline and then quickly discard the excess, which can eventually lead to fatigue, a weakened immune system, and even organ damage. However, there are endless positive impacts that developing and maintaining healthy relationships can have on your health and overall well-being. So people who have positive relationships have heart rates and blood pressure that respond better to stress. A strong social network is associated with a healthier endocrine system and healthier cardiovascular functioning. A healthy social life can enhance the immune system's ability to fight off infectious disease. People who develop and maintain healthy relationships can have a 50% increased chance of longevity. A strong social network is associated with having lower rates of anxiety and depression and having higher self-esteem and empathy for others. And lastly, a healthy social life also allows you to have better emotion regulation skills. And speaking of all these positive health impacts, Brooke will share more about blue zones, which is a newer topic to me, but I find it super interesting. Thanks, Melissa. So who here has heard of the term blue zones or know exactly what they entail? Basically, the term refers to geographic areas in which people have low rates of chronic disease and they live longer than anywhere else, which sounds kind of nice, doesn't it? Um, in this next slide, we'll watch part of a TED talk from a woman named Susan Pinker, but basically just to give you some background on who she is and what her talk is about. Uh, Susan Pinker was curious as to why people were living so much longer in these blue zones. And so what she did was she set out to go and check it one out. She went to the island of Sardinia, which is an Italian island in the Mediterranean. as there are in North America. So a centenarian is someone who lives 100 years or older. And it's also the only place where men live as long as women. So Pinker went to Sardinia and she started interviewing all of these centenarians and was trying to find uh, some commonalities between all of them. And what she noticed while she was there and was that they all lived in tightly knit communities they were surrounded by others who loved them. Their lives were always intersecting with one another, whether it be extended family dropping by during interviews or neighbors, and they had these really close-knit relationships with their priests, their barkeepers, the grocers. They were all just very close with one another. Uh, they had these deeply rooted social connections. So we're gonna take a look at part of, a TED, uh, part of her TED Talk and what she discusses a study on longevity and we'll go into a little bit more detail. Being a pilot in the Air Force is freedom, service, proud to serve my country. I love my job. <laughs> now these centenary stories along with the science that underpins them prompted me to ask myself some questions too, such as when am I gonna die and how can I put that day off? And as you'll see, the answer is not what we expect. Julian Holt Lundstedt is a researcher at Brigham Young University, and she addressed this very question in a series of studies of tens of thousands of middle aged people, much like this audience here. And she looked at every aspect of their lifestyle their diet, their exercise, their marital status, how often they went to the doctor, whether they smoked or drank, etc. She recorded all of this. And then she and her colleagues sat tight and waited for seven years to see who would still be breathing. And of the people less standing, what reduced their chances of dying the most? 
That was her question. So let's now look at her data in summary, going from the least powerful predictor to the strongest, okay? So clean air, which is great, it doesn't predict how long you will live. Whether you have your hypertension treated is good, still not a strong predictor. Whether you're leaner, overweight, you can stop feeling guilty about this because it's only in third place. How much exercise you get is next, still only a moderate predictor. So if you've had a cardiac event and you're in rehab and exercising, getting higher now. Whether you've had a flu vaccine, did anybody here know that having a flu vaccine protects you more from doing exercise? Whether you were drinking and quit, or whether you're a moderate drinker, whether you don't smoke, or if you did, whether you quit. And getting towards the top predictors are two features. The doctor, if you're not feeling well, or who will take you to the hospital, or who will sit with you if you're having an ex existential crisis, if you're in despair. That, those people, that little clutch of people are a strong predictor if you have them of how long you'll live. And then something that surprised me, something that's called social integration. This means how much you interact with people as you move through your day. How many people do you talk to? And these mean both your weak and your strong bonds. So not just the people you're really close to who mean a lot to you, but like, do you talk to the guy who every day makes you your coffee? Um, do you talk to the postman? Do you talk to the woman who walks by your house every day with her dog? Do you play bridge or poker or have a book club? Those interactions are one of the strongest predictors of how long you live. Yep. So who, how many of you were surprised by these predictors of how long you'd live? I know I was definitely very surprised uh, when I first watched this uh, clip because basically, you know, in your head you think, oh, exercising, eating healthy, that'll, they are great contributors and they do definitely um, help, but I never think about my social interactions and how that can ultimately contribute to my overall well-being. So I know for me personally, I'm definitely going to be more conscious about saying hi or waving or giving a smile to someone uh, who I may come in contact with throughout the day. So as you can see, like Sardinian villagers, it's a biological imperative to know that we belong. Building in-person interactions into our very own cities, our workplaces, our agendas. It can bolster our immune systems, send feel-good hormones surging through our bloodstream and our brain, and ultimately help us live longer. You can kind of consider this and look at it as building your village, and building this village is ultimately a matter of life and death. So if you're wanting to take a more in-depth look into Blue Zones and into this TED Talk, we'll be providing a link on a resource page. And what we'll be doing is all of the resources, the videos, things that we've mentioned here uh, in our webinar today, we will make a page of all of the resources and you can access that on our Healthy Lifestyles website as well as the recording of this webinar. So now in seeing how important our social well-being is to our longevity, Melissa is going to go over a few strategies that can help us to improve our overall social health. Yes, so I have three important strategies for improving social health. And first we have make connections. So since social interactions have been found to enhance well-being, it's helpful to work on meaningful connections with your friends, family, romantic partners, or other people in your life. You could also create new connections by doing something fun, like joining an exercise group or taking a cooking class, for example. And next we have build healthy relationships. So once you've made connections, you'll need to nurture those relationships over time. Strong bonds are an essential component of your overall well-being. Even though building bonds takes work, a positive social support network is what will help make the good times better and the tough times easier. And third, get active together. After developing relationships, you can make the most out of them by getting active together. 
So for example, you and your friends or family could go for a walk together or make a healthy meal to eat. By becoming more active as a group, you will not only improve your social health, but your physical and mental health as well. And these three strategies might be a bit harder now, or you might have had to adapt to find new ways uh, to be social during the pandemic. But we want to know, how have you stayed socially well during COVID? So let us know in the chat box if you've had any good ideas or just things that you've been doing um, to maintain your social wellness during this pandemic. And we'll move on to ways to stay connected while social distancing as you guys are letting us know in the chat box what your good ideas are. And as Brooke mentioned before, we'll post a document on our Healthy Lifestyles website with this recorded presentation where you can access the resources that we're pointing out. And you might have heard of some of these ideas before, so I'm not going to mention all of them on the slide, but I wanted to point out some fun ways to stay connected with others that might be new to you. So there's a new way to watch Netflix together. It's called Netflix Party. And you can watch Netflix with your friends online and there's an added group chat feature that lets you chat in real time. So just like we're doing here on this webinar. There are online book clubs that you can join to stay connected with others. One club that I learned about is called Now Read This, which is a monthly book club from PBS NewsHour and the New York Times, Best, um, the New York Times Book Review. So a new book is presented each month and thoughtful discussion questions are posted daily for members to consider. And that's just one example, but there are also thousands of online book clubs through Goodreads as well. And there's a website that I found um, that will be posted in our resource document with um, over 100 fun things to do at home. And it had a ton of things to do, like watch online concerts with others, go on virtual tour around the world together, explore museums, art and theater. It had a lot of things to do with kids like virtual Disney rides, uh, resources for taking online classes, which you can do with a friend, and tips for the perfect social distance date night, whether you're single and willing to virtually mingle or in a relationship. And so let's just point out a few things that you guys have been telling about, uh, telling us about, but talking on the phone rather than just texting, dinner in the park, that sounds like fun playing card games, chatting with others, going on bike rides, meeting up and going for a run, talking over FaceTime, I know that's a popular one, video chatting, going on walks every day. Yeah, there's a ton of good ideas in here. And it's I do see a few that mention social media, and that's actually our next topic. So. Since we're talking about doing all of these things virtually, we wanted to wrap up by talking about social media. It's definitely a way to stay connected, and I think most of us have probably used some form of it. So Brooke will let us know how to be socially well with social media. Great, thanks. So it's been so fun reading everyone's comments and being able to feed off of one another and get ideas. Again, we're being social right here, right now, and I think that's awesome. But we are moving on to social media. How many of you use some form of social media? Whether it's Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, you name it. There's lots of different platforms out there. And it's a great way to help us keep it connected during a time where we're all supposed to be so disconnected. And while social media has a lot of great pros, there's also a lot of cons to its use. So we're wanting to talk about how to use it without damaging our social well-being. So first off, let's talk about all the good things that social media enables us to do. And you guys have hit on a few of those things. The first one is it allows you to communicate and stay up to date with friends and fam family around the world. I know for me, this has been an especially useful aspect of social media because I was here a few years ago from Hawaii and it was really hard for me to stay up to date with everyone back home and social media has allowed me to uh, know what's going on with my family and friends and loved ones 
just this past week, there was a big storm that was supposed to hit and it was hard for me not knowing what was going on and if everyone was going to be okay. There was supposed to be a lot of flooding and damage that was going to happen due to the storm. But through social media, I was able to stay up to date with my family and my loved ones and see that everyone was okay and that nothing too crazy happened, thankfully, and the storm ended up missing them. So it's, again, a great way to stay in touch and stay up to date with those around you. Next, it allows us to find new friends and communities, to network with other people who share similar interests or ambitions as we do. It allows us to join a worthwhile causes or raise awareness to about issues that are important to us. I know for me personally, I've been made aware of many important issues and I've been able to issues that I wouldn't have known about had someone not spoken up or shared something on a social media platform and, and being able to make aware and being made aware of these different issues and topics, I've been able to go and educate myself. So again, that's a really great aspect. And lastly, it allows you to seek or offer emotional support during tough times. So it, especially now during COVID, and as a lot of you have mentioned, you've been able to reach out to family and loved ones and see how they're doing. And I'm sure that being able to have that emotional support has been able to help keep everyone kind of sane. Uh, and while social media enables all of these really great uh, things, it can also enable a lot of not so great things. So first off, it enables feelings of inadequacy about life, appearance, different things like that. If you know that images you're viewing on social media are manipulated, they can still make you feel insecure about how you look or what's going on in your life. Similarly, we're all aware uh, that other people tend to just share the highlights of their lives and rarely show the low points that they experience. But that doesn't lessen those feelings of envy or dissatisfaction when you're scrolling through a friend's photos and see their vacations or reading about their new promotion at work. It's even though, you know, you know, it's just a highlight and everyone has highlights. It's still hard to compare yourself. I'm currently pregnant right now, and it's been really hard for me going on social media and comparing my pregnancy journey and the way I look and the way I feel to other moms journeys and how they're feeling. And oftentimes I compare myself and if I'm not feeling a certain way or looking a certain way they do, I catch myself feeling inadequate. And so it's time like times like those where I need to check in with myself um, and reevaluate why I'm on there and how it's making me feel. And we'll talk more about that on the next slide, but moving on to our next topic, the social media enables fear of missing out or FOMO. While FOMO has been around for far longer than social media, sites such as Facebook and Instagram seem to enable these feelings that others are having more fun or living better lives than you are. The idea that you're missing out on certain things can impact your self-esteem, it can trigger anxiety, and fuel even greater social media use. FOMO can compel you to pick up your phone every few minutes to check for updates or compulsively respond to each and every alert. Even if that means taking risks while you're driving, missing out on sleep at night, or prioritizing those online interactions over real world relationships. And lastly, social media can enable isolation, which is kind of counterintuitive. It's supposed to be bringing us together, but in doing some research, we found a study at the University of Pennsylvania that found that high usage of Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram increased rather than decreased feelings of loneliness. And conversely, the study found that people felt less lonely and isolate, less lonely and isolated when they reduced their social media usage. So we've talked about um, how can we prevent these detrimental feelings? Um, we're gonna talk about that here on the next slide. But before we do that, I'd like to ask you all what have you done to make social media work for you rather than against you? How have you been able to 
overcome those feelings at times or do you not have a problem with it? We'd love to know what the, uh, here's some of your input and answers. I know one thing that we're going to talk about here is reducing the time online, just like I had mentioned previously. Are there any barriers that you find to reducing that time, your your time on social media? I know yesterday we as a team were talking about a lot of times you have good intentions and you realize I'm spending way too much time on my phone. <laughs> and so you try to make a conscious effort to want to cut back but it's just it's a habit you go on your phone and your finger just kind of automatically goes to the app and <laughs> you check in to see uh what's going on you just kind of start scrolling out of habit and it's hard to break those habits sometimes i see here someone has made a comment uh limited my time on social media you mostly use it to keep in touch with your children and grandchildren that's great and using Pinterest folders to help organize meals for family. That's also great uh, ways to have, make it work for you rather than against you. Um, so in going back to that University of Pennsylvania uh, study we mentioned earlier, they found that reducing social media use to 30 minutes a day resulted in a significant reduction in anxiety and depression. You don't need to cut back your social media this drastically to improve your, your overall mental health. But the same study concluded that just being more mindful of your social media use can have beneficial results on your mood and your focus. So one of the ways that you can help be that can help you be more mindful and help you to maybe reduce this online time is you can use an app to track how much time you spend on social media each day and then set a goal of how much you want to reduce it by. I know for those of us who have iPhones, each week it'll give you a, a weekly update. I think it's on Sundays of how much screen time you're using. And it can say it's gone up by 10% this week or it's gone down by 12% this week. So I know for me, whenever I see an increase in my uh, usage of screen time, I try to make a conscious effort during the next week to bring that number down and next, you can also turn on yourself. If you are wanting to limit that time to 30 minutes or an hour a day, set a timer for 30 minutes or set a timer for an hour and get your fix. And then when that's done, you can move on and go about the rest of your day. You can also turn off your phone at certain times, so set it. Uh, bedtime for your phone in a sense and say at nine o'clock the phone's off it's away you can leave it at you can choose not to bring it to bed with you and leave it in another room to charge and out of sight out of mind right and lastly you can disable your social media notifications it's hard to resist that constant buzzing beeping and dinging of your phone alerting you to new messages or new news articles or things that are going on, but turning off those notifications can help you to regain control of your time and your focus. So speaking of focus, we can change your focus. Many of our us access social media purely out of habit or to mindlessly kill moments of downtime. But by focusing on your motivation for logging on, you can not only reduce the time you spend, but you can also improve your experience and avoid many of the negative aspects. So ultimately just do a self check. Ask, why am I checking this uh, media site at this time? And how does it make me feel? Am I just scrolling just to scroll or do I have an intention? Am I going to find specific information? Am I checking on a friend who's been ill or am I sharing photos of my kids with my family? Your experience is likely going to be very different when you're doing these things uh, rather than when you're going on simply because you're bored or you want to see how many likes you got from a previous post or to check if you're missing out on something. So next time you go to access the platform, pause for a moment 
and clarify your motivation for doing so. Lastly, we have expressing gratitude. So feeling and expressing gratitude about the important things in your life can be a welcome relief to resentment, animosity, and discontent sometimes generated by social media use. So the first thing you can do is you can take time for reflection. Try keeping a gratitude journal or using a gratitude app, keeping track of all the great memories and positives in your life, as well as those things and people you'd miss if they were suddenly absent from your life. If you're more prone to, to venting or posting negative things, you can express your gratitude, rather express your gratitude on social media and see how that maybe affects your mood or how you're feeling. Next, you can use uh, these social media sites to reach out and pay tribute to someone and say thanks for something that they've done for you. And lastly, you can practice mindfulness. By practicing mindfulness, you can learn to live more in the present moment. You can lessen the impact of FOMO and improve your overall well-being. And for those of you who aren't familiar, each week on Mondays, Healthy Lifestyles, we send out a weekly lineup email. And that email contains lots of great resources, activities that we have going on at Healthy Lifestyles, ways you can earn points, lots of great tips, things like that for the week. But what we always include in our uh, weekly Monday emails is a mindfulness activity. And so Jane, uh, one of our awesome team members, she puts together these great mindfulness activities, whether it's an open heart meditation, we have some mindful breathing, the list goes on and on. She's awesome at putting these all together. And we'll send out different mindfulness activities and those emails each week and you can access those and they can help really bring you back to the present moment and become more in tune with yourself and how you're feeling. So definitely keep an eye out for those, for those weekly emails. You can also find it on our YouTube channel. We have lots of our mindful, if you do miss a, a week, you can find those activities on our YouTube channel. And so I hope that we've been able to provide you with some valuable tools as to how to manage your social media use. If you are wanting some more information, uh, our health hub for this next month is focused on how you can be more actively engaged on social media and again using it to work for you rather than against you and if you do read our health hub it you can also get five healthy lifestyles points so keep an eye out for that we'll be sending out a link to our health hub on our monthly newsletter that'll go out next week so Keep an eye out for that. And again, if you do miss those emails, let us know. We'd love to help get you, make sure you're getting those emails, or you can always find our health hubs, our resources, things like that on our Healthy Lifestyles website. So we just like would like to say thank you so much for tuning in today. And don't forget to fill out our survey so that you can get your points for tuning in today. So thank you so much and I hope you all have a great day.